Hello, it's Brian Reynolds once again from Words of This Life Ministry as we uh, carry on with our study in the Psalms, uh, the Psalms in 10 minutes or less. Uh, today we're on Psalm 30, and uh, just as the heading tells us, it's a psalm of deliverance. There was a time in David's life when uh, he was under great pressure, even uh, perhaps was under the threat of death, and the Lord wrought a deliverance for him, and then his... his um, worries um, and his oppression ceased and he turned his tongue uh, uh, to praise God uh, for the deliverance that he received even though perhaps he even thought that life at, his life itself was at stake but God turned the situation around and he gave praise and glory to God for the deliverance that's really the background of the psalm it's a psalm in some ways a psalm of resurrection and you get that in uh, verse, uh, for example, verse 3, O Lord, thou hast brought my soul uh, from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive. I should not go down to the pit. That I should not go down to the pit. And then sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. That really sets the tone for the psalm. And it's much like uh, we have in the New Testament, where the Apostle Paul speaks of this in Second Corinthians chapter 1, where he speaks of himself as even having, dis and his fellow laborers, of even having despaired of life, and that the sentence of death was in them and in him. Uh, it, he says this, he says, that in order that we rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead, is because our God is the God of resurrection, it, that even though Paul had the sentence of death in his life, and I think the occasion was... Uh, when he was at the um, theater in Ephesus, and they were about ready to you know, pretty well tear him from limb, uh, from limb to limb, tear him in pieces, uh, he said the sentence of death was in us. But they did not despair of, of life, because ultimately because God is the God of resurrection. And that's really how should, we should walk as Christians. The sentence of death is upon us uh, because of sin, but also now because Christ has died and we have died in him, that's our deliverance. And he was raised again from the dead. And so we have the hope of resurrection. And the, and the Christian, as A. Uh, Pritham says, this is to be known and enjoyed now before death. That is, we walk in the conscious realization of resurrection, of resurrection life, because the resurrection will come. And so we go on in the psalm to a, a very well-known verse. It's verse 5. that's often quoted. It's often on plaques. Uh, on the wall in people's houses or in Christian bookstores. Verse 5 says, uh, For his anger endures but for a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And here we get the same theme as we've been uh, speaking about. You know, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, it says that we're accepted in the Beloved. The Christian is in the Beloved. He's in Christ. And if you'll check that verse in the Darby translation, Ephesians 1, verse 6, uh, it says that we've been taken into favor in the beloved, that the believer stands in all the favor of Christ. How much does Christ stand in favor of God? If you would think about that, that's exactly the favor that you stand before God in. You've been taken into favor in the beloved. And then he says in his, uh, in his favor is life. Now we know uh, as believers in this dispensation that we have eternal life. Uh, so did the Old Testament saints, but it was not so clear for them as it is for us. And there are, there are verses which speak of eternal life in the Old Testament, just as there are verses that speak of the resurrection. But it wasn't brought out in its fullness and in its clarity until we get to the New Testament. As Paul says in Second Timothy, he says that life in immortality has been brought to light through the gospel. Now we have the full blaze, the full glory of the doctrine of eternal life and the hope of resurrection, present about eternal life and the hope of resurrection. And then the well-known verse, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And I'm thinking that the Lord Jesus was, was uh, had this verse probably on his heart when he spoke to his disciples on the night of his betrayal, when he was about to be arrested in John's gospel, uh, chapter 16. And in verse 19 we read, Now Jesus knew that they, they were desirous, that is the apostles, to ask him, and said unto him, Do you inquire among yourselves what I said a little while, and you shall not see me? And again a little while, 
and you shall see me. The Lord had been speaking and alluding to his death and his resurrection. And, and so he goes on in verse 20. Truly, truly, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail or in labor with giving birth to a child, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the, her anguish for the joy that a man child is born into the world. And here's the figure of death and resurrection, of travailing and pain and suffering. But then all that turned to joy. And the Lord told the disciples, you know, when they crucified me, the world will will uh, rejoice and you will weep and sorrow. But on the resurrection morning, uh, you will rejoice when you see me in resurrection. And, you know, this world that we're living in is a world of sorrow. Death is uh, marked across its uh, across the whole scene here. And um, but we as believers have the hope of resurrection. But, you know, we're not exempt as believers from suffering. And there are doctrines out there, teachers out there that say, you know, if you believe in, in Jesus Christ, then all your problems will disappear and you'll never get sick. There will never be sorrow. There will never be tragedy. There will never be trouble. That's simply a false gospel. I'll say that right up front. That is a false gospel. We're called not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him and suffer with him. And But we're, the sufferings that believers go through are common with the sufferings of, of those in the world. And Paul brings this out in Romans chapter 8, verse 22, where he says, For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. The whole creation is groaning in pain. The animal kingdom, you know, the unbelievers, everything, the whole situation is groaning in, in pain. And there's sorrow, there's death, there's tragedy, there's war, there's suffering. Verse 23, though, he says, And not only they, but we ourselves also, we which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, that is, the redemption of our body. And he says that we believers, too, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan as well. Notice he doesn't say we grumble, but we groan. That is, we have the same situations come into our lives as people in the world. You know, we experience sorrow. We experience tragedy. All the things that happen to everybody happens to us. But with this difference, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. The Spirit has come as a down payment, a first fruit of the glory to come, of, as a promise of what will come. And that uh, leads us to uh, the hope, you know, of the redemption of our body, that we're waiting for this body, this body. And he um, elaborates this on this in Romans chapter 8. I don't have the time to really go into it. But... You know, the manifestation of the sons of God and glory and so on. That's our hope, uh, dear Christian. And we have that as a living, abiding hope through the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. So, weeping may endure for a night, yes. But uh, joy comes in the morning. And then we get in verse 11. Thou hast turned, me, uh, turned for me my morning into dancing. That's how it'll be. You know, the first morning in, in heaven, uh, you'll take a step of dancing. You'll leap for joy, just like that lame man that was healed. I'm sure of it. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise unto you. We'll sing praise to the Lord in heaven. Worthy is the Lamb. Notice it says my glory. Often in the Old Testament our tongue is described as our glory. But how often it is, but instead of being our glory, it's our shame. But it ought to be our glory. We ought to use it for the glory of God. To, to give praise to him for the deliverance that we experience now and we walk in the power, the knowledge of the hope of resurrection and the glory that will come, uh, that we will experience in the resurrection. We can praise him and give glory to him now, even now during the time of sorrow and suffering.